I want to spend another day talking about GUI because there's uh, a lot to talk about. There's a lot we didn't cover in terms of more intermediate advanced techniques and I hope the things we covered today will hopefully be uh, useful in your final projects or working on things down the road. It's nice to be able to make GUIs, I think. It's, the code, code takes you pretty far, but there are lots of situations when it's, it's nice to be able to move fluidly through visual interfaces and doing all that sort of uh, design stuff. So um, I think there are a couple of help files I want to start with, which I don't think I covered last week. There's uh, a, a guide file called Introduction to GUI. And this is a, you know, not a help file exactly, but just a, a sort of a, I think it's actually classified as a, as a guide file. So it's a good, a good read, I suppose, just to generally understand how uh, GUI works in Super Collider. And it also begins with talking about this redirect system that I talked about last week, which it describes as a pretty nasty <laughs> GUI class system. So there were, it was, it was not ideal a while ago but it's, uh, it's much more uniform and it's, it's a nice, nice GUI system these days. There's also list of GUI classes, which is an overview file that is you know, primarily just a list of the classes you can encounter. And we've seen some of these already, window, button, slider, I'm sure knob is here somewhere, down at the bottom apparently. Uh, and you can also get a sense of the kit specific platform dependent classes but nowadays we just rely on this column on the left here. I think this is a nearly complete um, list. There's, I noticed that there's a there's a GUI object called level indicator which is another type of view. It's, it's basically um, these things here. These are level indicators but I don't know why they're not in that list. It could just be that they've been omitted. But this is a pretty near complete list. A good place to look for just GUI objects that perform a certain function. And you can pretty much find what you're looking for, I think. So last week we talked about windows and views and basic means of interaction. Like, um, uh, you know, just setting the background color, making something visible or invisible. And one of, some of the most important attributes or variables or methods were value. Uh, you know, accessing the value of a GUI object, action, which is a function that gets evaluated when we interact with that, and there's also the concept of setting and getting. In setting, we uh, we say if we have some, let's imagine we have a slider called x, we can say dot value underscore, and then provide. So this this expression here is a setter. It says your value is now 0.5, and then we can get an attribute by simply calling the method, and this this value gives us the current value of some object. And setting and getting is really the, the backbone of working with GUI, because GUI, we represent information, we want to access that information, we also want to change that information. And you can do a whole lot of stuff with just knowing those basic types of, of um, manipulations. So uh, let's look at, um, I have a, an example here, I've cooked up an example ahead of time. So we're going to boot the server, and we have a little chunk of code here in which I declare some local variables. We could use global variables. It really doesn't matter uh, in this case. And we make a new window. Uh, it's um, you know square window, 300 by 300 pixels. And then we play a synth whose cutoff frequency is 200, and we're passing a stereo pulse wave through a low-pass filter and its cutoff frequency is modulatable. Very basic stuff. We put a slider on the window and give it an action. And that action is to set the cutoff frequency of the synth using its value. And very important here, we have to map this to a reasonable value because sliders, knobs, buttons, maybe not buttons, but the, uh, the, the um, continuous style controllers like knobs and, and sliders, they they live in this world where their value is zero at the minimum and one at the top. And, and this is a bad range for most synthesis parameters. So we use lin exp to take this linear behavior of the slider and map it onto an exponential range where we can very audibly filter the sound. Okay. I'm going to 
hit command period there. So it seems all well and good, right? But uh, let's, let's uh, listen to what happens if we, instead of dragging, we click on discontinuous parts of the slider. So it's, it's not so bad if we click near where the slider handle currently is, but if we do an in, a, a sort of very large discontinuous change to the value of the view, that results in a large discontinuous change being passed to the synth. And this is not the only case where this ugly click occurs, but it's, it's definitely a big problem with filters. When you, you know, we always talk about a filter sweep or using an envelope to control some filter. If you change a parameter, of some synthesis process instantaneously. Depending on what it is, you'll get a, a moderate to uh, egregious click, particularly true with filters. But even if you just change the frequency of an oscillator or the amplitude of an oscillator discontinuously, uh, it, it kind of puts a, an ugly discontinuity somehow in the waveform. So how do we fix this? I mean, the, the inherent problem here is that uh, the, the, there's a finite number of pixels on the screen. And there's a, a generous amount here, you know, 250 or something like that. So that's enough as long as we drag it. But there's something inherently discrete about this slider. Um, but uh, it doesn't mean our sound has to be discrete. The solution here is to lag the parameter being modulated. Lag is a eugen, actually. It's a, technically a type of low-pass filter, but the, it's designed specifically for cases like this where we want to smooth out some control signal. So any discontinuous change gets tr interpolated uh, so that it becomes a sort of exponential zoop instead of a sudden change. And there's a convenience method, which is just lag. So we can say cf.lag, and then we provide a time in seconds that we want this uh, any change, every change that happens to the slider is going to get translated into an interpolation from the current value to this new value. And so we want this to be, you know, small, but not too small, you know, big enough that we get rid of that click and small enough that the behavior doesn't become sluggish. So something like three hundredths of a second is probably a good starting place. But not quite enough, I think. So we'll inch this up to like a whole tenth of a second. You know, so that's a little bit better. You can, it's really a matter of taste, I think, if you, if you don't mind uh, getting things, you know, a little kind of putting your synthesis into molasses here a little bit, you know. It's quite a, quite a noticeable glissando here. It's, just, it's not really a glissando, you know, you know what I mean. Uh, so this can be as long as you want, but if it's, you know, uh, it can also be as small as you want. Uh, so this is a very important thing to keep in mind as you're building GUI that interacts with sound, because it's possible for, in a number of ways for the user to uh, invoke some, you know, cause some discontinuous change to happen, and you don't want that to get mixed into your sound because, you know, it sounds bad. So this is um, lag. The lag has a lot of, it's, it, you know, a, when you're using a controller, uh, like one of these, or, um, uh, or you know, any, any sort of controller, or an Arduino, a Nintendo Wiimote, or something like that, there's lots of cases where you can accidentally have some wobbly data that's kind of all over the place, and you, lag is an excellent way to smooth that out. There's also var lag, which is lag, but with a custom interpolation kind of thing. So we can say uh, var lag, and then we provide the time and then the curvature. So zero is linear, and then positive values are just like curves for envelopes, and negative values are the same. You know, it sort of just bends the, the interpolation curve in one direction or the other. So we can try linear here, see what that sounds like. All right, maybe we can, now we can maybe take this back down a little bit. Or if we make this like something like five. So I think I think negative values work well here because they're gonna cause the interpolation to change quickly at first and then slowly. 
think that's a little too much. Maybe we'll go down to like six. You get the idea. Yeah. So lag, lag and var lag, keep those in mind. It's a good way to keep your synthesis nice and clean. All right, so that's lag. Uh, let's um, switch over, let's make a GUI. I think I'm gonna grab uh, this one here just because I have a couple of things prepared today. And it's just a window with a slider. And what I want to talk about here are uh, key actions and mouse actions. Now there's already some built-in behaviors to a lot of GUI objects in response to mouse and keyboard events. For example, when we click on this slider, there's an action that we don't have to define because it's so fundamental, which causes the you know, the value of the slider to change. Right? This, is a, this is something which is already programmed in. Uh, and, uh, but that's, that's basically it. I mean, you click and drag and you, know, you move the slider. Uh, there are also some key actions um, which are predefined for sliders. The pressing C on your keyboard will center the knob. Uh, pressing N and X, N, X, N, X, N, X is um, low and high. And it took me a long time to realize why this is N and X. It's because of the words minimum and maximum. So you can't use M because they both start with M, but the third letter of those words, minimum and maximum. So min and max. Uh, R will randomize. Press R a bunch of times. So, and I think this works for knobs too. You can randomize center and min and max knobs. Uh, buttons, for example, let's make one of these. Uh, let's say, let's go over by 75, 25, 100, 100. And let's just give this two states, um, zero and one. Do it like this, to an array containing arrays. And we'll make the font big. Uh, right? Space bar on a button is the same as clicking. And this also introduces the idea of focus. Um, a GUI object can be in focus. And right now the button is in focus, but if I press the tab key, I don't know if you can see this, but it's, it's, there's a thin blue outline around the object which is in focus. And by def some, de some GUI objects can focus by default, like buttons and sliders. Others, like static text, they don't focus by default. But any GUI object, any view, can be made focusable or non-focusable using um, can focus. I think that is the method. And it's a, a Boolean, just like visible or enabled. Uh, so you can, uh, it's, it's just nice to sort of be able to tab around. You know, you can randomize and press tab and hit this button a bunch of times. So these, these key and mouse actions are, are already defined. They're very convenient, but you can make your own. And as an example, let's, um, you know, sometimes in, a, in a, a graphical user interface, when you hover over uh, a slider, it changes color to let you know that that's the one you're about to press or something like that, just as a nice way of alerting you say, this is, you know, just showing you stuff. So let's try to, let's make it so that this slider changes its background color when the mouse is over it. These methods that we're gonna cover here, the family of methods, they're all in the view help file. And there's a section called uh, key and mouse event processing. So they're various, uh, it's, it's a lot like the action function of, of a button or a slider. There are special action functions that you can append to a GUI object, like something to do when the mouse gets pressed down, something when the mouse is released. If the mouse moves without any buttons pressed over it, uh, actually, how is mouse move and mouse over? This is moves after, okay, so mouse move is click and, and move. Mouse over is just move, no clicking. Uh, when the mouse wheel moves, you have one of those. Mouse enter, mouse leave, this is just the sort of is it happens once as the mouse enters and anyway you get the idea the key uh, key actions are key down key up uh, and and that's basically it so let's we'll add a um, a mouse action and a key action to this slider <coughs> so let's do mouse enter action 
it's just like the action function. Uh, we, you know, this is this is an attribute or a variable which contains a function. Oops. And in the, in the regular action function, we get to pass in an argument which represents the view. But in the mouse actions, there are two additional parameters that we might want to use, we might not want to use. But whatever we call them, they are going to represent the horizontal and vertical coordinates of the mouse cursor with respect to that view. Right? So it, it basically tells you where the mouse actually is. In some cases, we don't actually need these. You can just ignore them. But like, you might want the, I don't know if you're being really uh, exotic with your GUIs, you can make a sort of rainbow thing happen as you hover the mouse across the slider. Or, you know, who knows? Right? Lots of possibilities. But um, for now, let's just say uh, view x, y, dot post ln. Right? So we're going to enter the view with the mouse. There we go. Oh. Nil, nil. That's not, I was expecting, expecting some coordinates here. What did I do wrong? Oh, you know, well, I think, I think I, this is what I have to do here. Uh, let's see if this works. No. <laughs> Why is it nil? Let's do mouse move action or mouse over action. I'm a little confused here. This might, I think I might be mixing things up here. Okay. So that's not working. I, I think it, uh, by default, windows don't accept mouse over, which means any views placed on them also can't accept mouse over. So the default is false. We have to make that true. So let's see if mouse enter action now works. I don't know why these are nil. Let me just read mouse action here. View x, y. It could be, well, I don't know. It says that the, uh, the function accepts view x, y, but it might be that it doesn't somehow. If I'm doing something wrong, I don't know what it is. But that's OK, because we don't actually need these. I just thought I'd demonstrate what we get. And, we, and you did see this with mouse over action. We can see exactly where the mouse is, and so we can use that information to modify the action. So let's say uh, view.background color dot, uh, say, 0, 0 0.71. So this is, should be a bluish color. And, of course, and then we probably want to make a mouse leave action, too, so that it stops being blue when we leave. So we'll just copy this here, say mouse leave action. And I'm not actually sure what the default color is. I think it's gray something. Maybe something. I think it's too light. I think it's 75. That looks about right. Yeah. So we can move the slider, take the mouse away. And there we go. We've added a mouse action to this. So a key action, um, we'll do something kind of trivial here. Key down action. And uh, we'll pass in the, uh, the view like we can. And we'll say uh, key rest dot post ln. So any, it doesn't matter what key. When, when a key goes down, it's going to say key pressed. Key pressed. Right. Uh, and if I hit tab and press like one of my letter keys, hold on, got to clear the post window here. It doesn't work anymore because it's not in focus. Only the key actions are only, uh, you know, uh, sensitive to what's happening if the GUI object itself is in focus. So it's got to be in focus. 
you can also register key actions to the view on the window, key and mouse actions. So you, you do something like uh, uh, w.view.keyDownAction. So if we actually, if we move this function over here, so now I press a letter key, we get that if I hit tab, still works because the, the entire interface uh, is the thing that has registered the key action. So it doesn't matter what individual GUI object is in focus because they live on the main parent view, that's the thing listening. So um, you, can, you can register key actions for individual objects or the entire thing or anything in between. So this is kind of boring, right? We, we act like we wanna do something only if the letter A is pressed, for example. So these, these key down actions actually accept a lot of, a lot of arguments. Uh, the view, the character, so the actual, you know, A, you know, capital W, percent sign, the, the actual character being uh, associated with that key. Uh, this is some sort of bitwise binary value which indicates which modifier keys are being held down. So, like, you can know if shift is held down or alt is held down. And then a bunch of um, integers stuff which represents the key being pressed. So, I'm going to post it all. Actually, okay, view, care, mod, uni, decode, key. Okay, we're going to push A, push B, C. What? Where's my C? <laughs> Why does it not? Oh, is my C broken? Oh, it centered the slider. Thank you. I don't think I would have caught that. Yeah, so, um, uh, yeah, I, well, but one way we can do this is by uh, taking focusability away from the slider. And uh, we might as well do it for the button, too, because I think that's going to take focus, and who knows what the C key is going to do there as well. Okay, A, B, C, D, yeah, okay. Ooh, I was really worried. That one of my keys just spontaneously broken. So we're, we're getting the, um, uh, the, the view associated with this action, the character, any modifier keys that are pressed, uh, the uh, Unicode, the key code, and then the key. So like this is, um, I don't know that much about this, but we're dealing with kind of like ASCII key codes and stuff like that. I know this key here is associated with the QT GUI system. So some, some of these are hardware dependent, some of these are not. So if you actually try this at home and you type A, B, C, D, you might get some, some of these should be the same and some of these might be different. Also, I, I don't type in QWERTY, I'm in Dvorak, so that also kind of messes things up. So. But as long as you're doing just like a letter or a number or a symbol, character is usually fine. So uh, we, can, we can keep all those. We'll say if uh, care equals the letter uh, X. This is how we do cares, by the way. It's a, we just take a character, we precede the dollar sign, and that tells SuperCollider that we're talking about a character here. I mean, we, can't, we can't say X here because X, you know, is its own thing. We need to designate the class character. So if it's X, then we'll say um, uh, V dot enabled, uh, V dot enabled dot not. <laughs> So V is our slider. I think I put V because I was doing view or something. It doesn't really matter what it's called. And this is going to set the enabled attribute to the opposite. Not is the, right, true becomes false, false becomes true. Uh, so if, if, it's, if it's enabled, it'll become disabled and vice versa. And we should see the, like the slider very slightly change colors when, uh, we could even um, uh, post LN this just to see the, the enabled status. And then we need a semicolon. So let's push X. Yeah, false. So now it's, I can't click on it. And if I push X again, then it wakes back up. Yeah. Disabled, enabled. So we have, a, we have a key. And this is a, this is a really nice way. You can like, uh, make a window with no sliders or faders or anything on it, but just define a whole bunch of key actions for the view 
so that it's just like a surface that allows you to pass keyboarding foot into SuperCollider and you can like map samples to different letters and like play it like kind of an instrument. You know, it's kind of a fun thing to do. All right, so that's, that's key and, and mouse action. They're, they're pretty much all, all right here in the view help file. And uh, yeah, it takes a little, little getting used to and sort of, you know, I, there, was, there was that interesting thing with uh, not the the C is reserved, I guess, for centering sliders, and but uh, there's always there's always clever workarounds, and it just takes a little little time getting used to it. Okay, uh, I'm going to copy this into my lecture code, and then open this back up because I wanted to use it for something different. Okay, um, let's say we want to make a whole bunch of sliders across the view here. We've got all this horizontal space. We want to make like a bank of sliders. Um, we can do this and change the numbers. Uh, like I think we'll just make three for now. And you know, we shouldn't call them all V obviously. Uh, okay, I did the wrong parameter. I made them go down instead of over. <laughs> right. Um, what what is the thing I want you to think of when you start doing this? When you when you when you start you know finding yourself doing this so many times, what is it that you should be doing instead? Use yeah, use a loop or yeah, iterate. Use use some structure that allows you to do this over and over again. So we're gonna say v. Well, let me get rid of all this. Equals uh, eight dot collect. And we're going to pass in an iteration counter, so 0 through 7. And we can't stop there because what happens here is we make eight sliders, but they all go right on top of each other because they all have the same uh, location and dimensions. So what we need to do is incorporate this iteration counter into uh, this x position value. So how do we do that? Well. Um, you know, i is going to be 0, then 1, then 2, then 3. And we want that to be 25, 27, sorry, 25, 75, 125, uh, and so on. So we could use uh, lin-lin, 0 to 7, uh, 25 to 25, we have to kind of do the math here. I guess it would be 25 times 8, right? I think. Let's see if that works. Oh, yeah, look at that. That's nice. Um, uh, or we could we could increase the spacing a little bit right, until it looks right. So this is a nice way to just kind of fan out a whole bunch of GUI objects without having to type it. And also the, they're all stored in this array, which means uh, actually let's do always on top. So if we do v uh, at three. That's a slider, uh, value 0.5. So it's very easy to talk to these things because collect returns an array, stores it in here. So it's pretty nice. I, I don't, usually what I will just do is, is even simpler. I'll just say uh, times the spacing that I want plus the initial offset. And that also works. So we can just very easily change the pixel spacing from the left edge of each one. So we can make them as close together as possible, or space them out, and then this will shift them away from the uh, left side. And this is nice because if you, if you had a whole bunch of sliders and you did it manually, you'd have to change the numbers on each one every time you wanted to move them. So thinking algorithmically is a nice way to do it. Um, but even this is not the what I think is the best way to do it because we still have to manage the pixels here. Uh, so the the way I think is is optimal has to do with uh, decorators, and there's one decorator in particular. It's called Flow Layout. A decorator is um, uh, basically a positional arrangement manager that can be attached to any view, and once attached, it handles the X Y placement of views. Uh, we only need to specify the size of the views. 
and their position is handled automatically. And what Flow Layout does is basically turns a window into like word processing software where it starts on the top left and starts, when we say make a view, it just puts it in the top left and then move to the right and move to the right, move to the right. If it runs out of uh, left, right space, it makes a new line and then goes again and, and starts in the left. So let's see how this works. We're going to say w.view.decorator. Set it to an instance of flow layout. And flow layout needs three things. It needs a bounds, just like every, just like any view object. And this, almost always, this is the exact same bounds of the view that it's being attached to. You, know, it's, it's you could you could sort of assign a flow layout to a subsection of a view if you wanted to, but pretty much you always want it to be the the bounds of the parent object. So you're using the entire canvas on the window. And then it needs a margin and a gap. And margin and gap are both provided or supplied using the point class. So point is a very simple object. In, in a way, it's a lot like integer or float. It's just a value. Um, it's, you know, it's different in that it's a two-dimensional value. It's an x and a y. But it's, it's abstract, a lot like the way the rect class is abstract. We have a, uh, a sort of coordinate point for the bottom left, and then we have a, a width and a height. Just, just as much information as we need to define this very simple entity. So a point can be expressed like uh, this, the point 3 comma 5. And there's a lovely syntax shortcut using the at sign. So 3 at 5 is just a convenient way to do this. So we're going to specify points here. And what, what they um, signify, what margin signifies, is a border around the flow layout where views will not be placed. So just so things aren't crammed right up against the edge of the window. And so this is like a, a uh, the, I think, what is it? It must be horizontal border and then vertical border. So usually we want this to be the same, but maybe sometimes you want like a thick border on the sides, but a thin border on the top, in which case you might do something like uh, this, you know? But we'll just put a 10 pixel border around the whole thing. And then a gap, and this is the horizontal and vertical spacing relative to, between two objects that are gonna be placed on the view. So like we put a, put a button, and make another button, the, uh, they're going to be 10 pixels apart. And if their buttons end up down below, then they're going to be 10 pixels apart as well. So these can be whatever you like. Let's make the, um, this border a little bit thicker outer border, but then less border between the individual objects. OK. Now we can say b equals 40, uh, collect. And now for the bounds, we normally specify a rect here. We don't need to anymore because the x, y position is already handled. So instead, we can just provide a point, which is interpreted as the height and width of the object. Okay. Woo, 40 buttons. So I, I, you know, the math is a little, this, you'd have to do a little bit of adjustment here, but it's really very easy. We can make the buttons. Uh, a little smaller, and now we can get all 40 on there. And then we say, okay, how many are here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 10, 11. So let's make them a little bit uh, more. Yeah, so that's nice. You know, we can play with this number until it looks nice. Yeah, lovely. Maybe something like that. Very nice way to make all these buttons at once. And you can uh, pass, don't forget, you know, in a collect, you can pass a. Uh, pass an argument in. So this counter is going to be 0 through 39. So we can say states. Uh, we'll just give, give these button uh, two states. It'll have the same. It'll do uh, i plus 1. Uh, I don't know if we have to convert this to a string. It might be fine just giving it a number. We'll find out. Uh, <clears throat> That'll be the first state. And the other one will be like this. There we 
go. So now we just have a whole bunch of buttons with two states. We could just as easily add an action to each one and you know, define the action in terms of which button it is. Uh, just really, now at this point, it's like, what do we want this GUI to do? We don't really have a plan. We're just kind of showing the visual. But you know, this is, it's not a lot of code for a quite nice looking you know, set of buttons. And uh, what's, what's really nice here, like if we, let's make some more stuff. If we say uh, um, x equals 10.collect, um, let's make some sliders, and these are going to be, I don't know, 20 by 80. Just eyeballing it in here. Right, and let's let's bump this over, so I'm not always moving it. Uh, 40, 150, too many. Well, like this, making this look nice. Yeah. Okay. I should have <laughs> just guessing. I should have used the same number. Uh, if we want to switch the sliders with the buttons, uh, it's very, very easy. All we do is just take this chunk and move it up here. And there you go. Imagine how much work this would be if you made each individual GUI object with its own coordinates. It'd be a ton of work. So now we have all, this, all these lovely sliders, all these buttons, and we're in business. All, now it's just a matter of giving them meaningful actions. So this flow layout is the is the takeaway here. It's just uh, just automates the um, positioning, so you don't have to really think about it nearly as much. It's very nice. <coughs> All right, let's talk about. Uh, we're going to come back to uh, MIDI for a moment because I've got. I know you, uh, you can't really see it live, but you'll be able to see it on the rewatch. But I've got this Korg Nano Control over here, and uh, let's. Um, uh, I'll again. I'll paste this into my lecture code and save that. Close this. Open it back up. And let's say that I want to control this slider with one of these MIDI sliders. And I, I actually think you, you you have almost everything you need to know already. We've covered MIDI. We know about setting and getting and things like that. So it's really just a matter of uh, I mean, what you do first is uh, MIDI in, not connect all, just to talk to MIDI devices. And we'd make a uh, MIDI def. Uh, so for example, just revisiting what we've got here. So I could just move a slider. And we're just posting the value in the controller number as they come in. Here's the knob, some of these buttons. Uh, all right, so instead of posting it, we just want to say um, if uh, num, uh, let's see, the, the slider down here is uh, controller number 0. So if number equals 0, v dot value, I suppose value action, if we want to also call the action of the slider. To uh, we set this to val. Uh, well, actually, val divided by 127, because we're dealing with MIDI data in here, and the slider is thinking in terms of zero to one. Uh, and this is not going to work. <laughs> yeah, so we get a big messy situation down here. the The error is you cannot er, you cannot use this qt functionality in the current thread try scheduling on app clock instead error set property failed there is a rule with gui objects and i cannot remember off the top of my head where where this which help file this is in because it's kind of related to multiple classes but you are only allowed to create communicate with and and interact with gui objects through code when you are in what's called the main application context. 
So if you're just running code in the environment, that's fine. If you are just having GUI objects call other GUI objects, that's fine. Uh, the cases where you are not where this error comes up is when you're using a receiver object like a MIDI def or an OSC def or something taking in values from outside, and those those functions are not allowed to talk to um, GUI objects. Uh, also, if you are playing a routine, if you just make a routine and say dot play, and that routine includes calls to GUI objects, you'll get the same problem because routines play on the default tempo clock by default, and the tempo clock is considered outside of the main application context, so is system clock. So both of those clocks can't talk directly to GUI objects. The fix is very simple. Uh, we just need to uh, defer the problematic code so that it is scheduled on the app clock, which runs in the main application context. And we do this with the method defer. So you just take the, the code, which actually deals with the GUI, and we say defer. So now uh, we should be able to move this slider and move the fader. And I think no, none of the other faders will do anything, right? only this one here, because it's the only one with controller number zero. And just as a little reminder here, we don't even need to bother with the, um, the if. We can just uh, tell this MIDI def CC to only listen to controller zero by giving it a, an additional argument after the function. So this also works. It listens to my fader. It doesn't listen to any of the knobs or other faders or anything like that. So there we go. We've got MIDI talking to uh, our GUI. So a common thing you might do is you build a GUI to represent your physical controller and assign actions to the GUI objects and then have the MIDI def take the MIDI data in and call value action on the appropriate GUI objects. So passing the data in and saying, now do your action. And it's, um, you know, in, in, this, in this way, the, the MIDI def is really just kind of like a, a link in the chain. It's not actually performing any concrete action other than informing the GUI that it should update its values. So, uh, yeah, pretty nice. All right. Um, uh, I do before we talk about our last thing. I do want to. Uh, I'll uh, I'll post this, but just to give you an example, it's a bit longer here, and I'm introducing a, a few other concepts. I'm just going to show you what I have here. I, I I use flow layout and a couple other things to basically model my Korg Nano over here, and it's I've got it set so all the MIDI data comes in, all the sliders work, the knobs working as well, and these buttons will you know, turn red when I press them, both on the physical controller and on here as well. So just kind of just gives you a little example of what you can do. And it's it's not too much code. I I I you know I'm doing some I'll I'll post this in case anyone wants to study it. And it's really only going to work if you have this specific controller which sends these specific MIDI messages. But um, you know, not, not too many concepts. I am using something called uh, Simple Controller, which is uh, an object which allows you to build GUI according to the model view controller design pattern, which is something that I have um, been aware of for a while, but I'm really just starting to sink my teeth into. It's a, it's, it's a way of conceptualizing an interface uh, as three distinct components. The model, which is the, the data itself, the thing representing the data. Uh, the controller, which is this kind of simple controller, and it's a, just part of a mechanism which takes input from the user and uses it to inform the model how it should change. And the view, or the views, these are the visual objects which represent the data. And so when the model is changed, the views are registered as a dependent to the model, and so the model informs its dependents, hey, I've changed, redraw yourselves. And by isolating the functionalities here and describing these in terms of their responsibilities, it's a little bit more work to set up, but it's much more flexible, and it avoids a lot of problems. And uh, we might actually, I, I'm on the fence, but we might talk about this in a little bit more detail next week, just to kind of, because like imagine you have a, two sliders that represent the, a, a single level of a stereo audio signal. But you want two sliders because you want to make it look like a stereo fader. Right? And if you have two faders, the worst case scenario is they call value action on each other, depending on which one you move, and then they enter a feedback loop and you crash. Right? 
And so you can think of one of them as being like the main slider and the other one just this passive one, which just kind of talks to the main one when you touch it. But model view controller kind of handles all of this. They're just either one, uh, you know, when, they, when you touch them, they act as a controller. They update some model and then the model tells the views, which are actually the same sliders, to passively update themselves. So it's, it's, uh, I, it, it's uh, I'm still wrapping my brain around it, but I, I think I get the gist and it's, it's a very clean way of thinking about interfaces. And this is, I've tried to use that here. With, uh, so you know, it doesn't even really matter if I adjust this with the mouse or with the fader. Um, uh, it's the, the model is changing either way, and no matter how the value changes, it always tells this view, redraw yourself, I've changed. The, the one thing it can't do is make the physical controller update itself because these faders aren't motorized. You know? But ideally, when I move this with the mouse, uh, you know, I, the, the controller says to the model, okay, you've changed, and then the model would tell its dependents, which are this thing here, and also the MIDI controller it would, it would send it a message saying, redraw yourself, move your fader, right, because it's changed. Um, anyway, uh, with the little time we have left, I want to talk about uh, drawing custom graphics and animations, because this is really cool. You can do this in Super Collider. It's not highly optimized for it, and we won't get through all of it, uh, but we'll pick up here, I think, next week. So the gist of it is uh, it's, it's a pair of classes, user view. This is a, a, a view just like slider and button. You know, it's a, it's a subclass of view, which doesn't really have any features other than the fact that we are allowed to draw on it using the other class, pen. So pen is a, uh, is a class where we actually don't create instances of a pen the way we create instances of a slider or a, a knob, but instead we just talk to the class, the singular class entity, pen. And we say, pen, move here, pen, draw this line, pen, fill this in with this color. Uh, so it looks like this. We're going to put a user view on the window, and we're going to cover the entire thing. Uh, and we're going to make the color uh, black. Right? So we just this is a window with a user view of the same size right on top, and it's got a black background. Now, uh, the user view has uh, an attribute called draw func. And this is a little bit like the action, not quite, but it's a function. And basically, whenever the user view is refreshed using the method refresh, or we just draw it, you know, or say whenever we want to update it, it's going to run this function. And in this function, we're allowed to use pen. So we can say pen dot uh, width, uh, five pixels, pen dot stroke color, white, uh, pen dot line, and we just give it two points, uh, 30 at 50, uh, 200 at 100. And then this doesn't actually draw the line, it simply specifies the construction of a line. Stroke is, tells the pen, all, stroke all the lines that you've constructed. And I need to delete my semicolon here because there's more stuff here. There we go. Right. So we've drawn this line from 3050 to 200, 100. Right. Two absolute points. And uh, let's, let's just do something, let's say rand uh, 10 to 480. And we'll just paste that in for all of the coordinates. And so random line, uh, I think I should do, I think it's 400 pixels by default, so I don't want it to draw off the, uh, and if I say u.refresh, it reevaluates the draw func. And so every time it's going to pick two new, it's pick, pick new random values and draw that line. And user views can be animated. Yeah, <laughs> I know. Pretty cool. And you can set the frame rate. So 20 frames per second, uh, 15, 10, 5. 
I think the default is 60. Um, and one thing I want to stress before we wrap up for the day is that SuperCollider is not optimized for graphics. That is, put a period on the end of that sentence, right? The way like processing, VDMX, like uh, Isadora, all these, all these, all these uh, sort of graphical visual programming tools, um, you know, they don't do sound very well. SuperCollider does sound really well. You can make 8,000 oscillators and it won't even blink. Uh, but if you try to make like a really complex pen function with like a whole lot of math, the, the math is not a problem, it's the, it's the screen refresh calls. Like there's a lot of stuff that happens for Super Collider to talk to your operating system and tell it how to draw stuff on your screen. So when you, when you get the frame rate, you'll, you'll get the average frame rate. Like if it's not, trust me, it is not hard to bring this program to its knees and just like throttle it completely with, by overwhelming it with graphical instructions. So, it's fun, it's interesting, and it can enhance a graphical user interface when done kind of strategically uh, to just like bring the user's attention over here and just a fun little visual effect. But um, it's, uh, you know, too much, you know, the, the threshold's pretty low for, for making it uh, take a trip on the struggle bus. But there's lots of cool stuff. We can draw circles, arcs, wedges, lines, rectangles, bezier curves, um, and we'll try to come up with some cool examples. And that was, that was what I had at the beginning, um, my bouncing ball with gravity. I mean, I have a, a key action here so I can hit space bar. And just, by, by default, the user view will clear itself. Every time it refreshes, it'll clear itself and then redraw. But you can make that, um, false if you want so that it doesn't uh, do it. And what I'm doing here is I'm drawing a rectangle which is transparent over each frame. So that's how we get these visual delay trails. It's a common trick. Right? But I can, I can say, um, uh, you know, don't, don't draw this. Right? And then it never, it just, it just doesn't clear it at all. It just draws the next frame so you can kind of it's like that solitaire game, you know, when you win and then the cards go flying. <laughs> yeah. nice. Okay, uh, so that's it for today. Uh, more, more to talk about. I think we'll do a little bit of a deeper dive into drawing and animation, some cool stuff we can do. I don't know, we've, we've kind of reached the end of the the core curriculum for this class and we've got one class left before fall break and then I think one more after that or some maybe two I, I don't have to look at the calendar but uh, I what I what I like to do if if you're all amenable is like you can bring final projects in progress to class and send them to me in advance and we can look at them and kind of debug and and just kind of talk over them as a group I think it's nice to see each other's work so um, you know it's it's flexible from here to the end but um, you know, keep in touch. Uh, just a reminder, I, wanna, I want the um, uh, emails for your, what you're planning for your final project. I think I have like three out of five emails right now. But send that to me by the end of the day, and uh, see you next week.